<clears throat> okay, so I think we got I think we successfully transferred over. It's amazing. Uh, did everyone make it okay? Anyone lose their anyone lose their luggage? Still here. Okay, awesome. How are you guys doing in New York? Good. People. The technical difficulties a little bit better now. Okay, awesome, awesome. Uh, I no one is typing in chat. Are people in? Okay, chat is good. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so let's take a minute or two. Collect ourselves. Oh. Oh. Boy, this is uh, this is more draining than I thought it would be. <clears throat> it looks so dark in there, man. Are you guys like just like did you not turn the lights on? It's just a gloomy bunch in New York, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, you know, so you asked, so what is the plan for the CS Fundamental Series? Uh, I have no idea. We just... We kind of uh, threw this together.
Okay. Looks like I'm we're back in action. Cool, cool, cool. <clears throat> I am back. Uh, everyone can still see me. Audio still good. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and jump back into it. So I'm gonna pop up the screen share here, and uh, let's see here, okay. All right, so let's talk about uh, memory. So once again, to understand memory, we need to understand how a computer is. Now this uh, diagram right here is gonna potentially look Nothing, but this is the data layers of a computer. Okay. Now, <clears throat> if you don't know much about a computer, and I'm assuming that most of you are, are not super familiar with like the hardware side of a computer, um, we use the word computer kind of loosely to mean like this big box of stuff. Um, but at the, the, the you know, bottom most core layer of a computer is what we call the CPU. Okay. Uh, it's also known as the central processing unit, I believe is what it stands for. And the CPU is the thing that's actually adding numbers together or moving numbers around or like doing doing like the work like the actual work you're asking the thing to do it's the one that's executing instructions moving things around uh, basically it's like the you know the, the the sort of homunculus or the sort of little person inside the computer is actually doing you know fundamentally pulling the levers right? the tiny little alien inside your computer that's CPU now the CPU has data in what are called registers okay and registers are just these little boxes that are like you know imagine your cpu like a little person inside of your computer like way down inside very very small person uh and the cpu has 16 of these registers and they're just these little boxes that can hold one uh you know usually like a, a uh like an integer of some sort or a pointer or something that way um and so it just holds numbers just holds binary data um and that's that's like all of the immediate workspace of your CPU. So your CPU is just standing there and, and looks around and is like, okay, I can like move things in between these registers. I can take something out of a register, add it to something else, you know, send it through my add circuit or, you know, whatever. I can do all these things. And registers are like my immediate workspace. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, so the little person in your CPU uh, has also a, an L1 cache. Okay. You can imagine this being like a, a library or like or not a library but like a uh, like a uh, bookshelf that's um, like in your cpu's house or in your cpu's room okay and this is just like a a reservoir of useful data that you've recently read um or that you're likely to read very soon it's very close by uh, and so you'll, you'll notice on the left side here i have these number of cycles and so basically what this means is that when i say one cycle for the uh um for the cpu register that's that to read from a cpu register if you're the CPU, it takes one clock cycle. So it's like one instruction. You just you just you know uh, read from the register just like that. It's like lightning fast. It's as fast as anything else. Okay. Now, if you have to, if the CPU has to like get up out of their chair and go walk over to the bookshelf and like grab something out of the bookshelf and come back, that wastes a little bit of time. Okay. So like the the L1 cache, uh, the level one cache. Is like this, this book is pretty good. It's like useful, uh, but it's a little bit far away, and it takes a little bit of time, and it sort of wastes time to go and like have to get some. I'd rather have it sort of on the desk. So you can imagine the registers is like my desk, and the L1 cache is like the library that I have close by, or not the library. I keep saying that the uh, the bookshelf. Okay. Now the L2 cache is even bigger. Um, so all these, so you you notice that it's coming to a point, right? Uh, the L1 cache is like uh, you know reasonably larger. So you know, some number of, uh, of kilobytes, I believe. Uh, and two caches is bigger. That's potentially like uh, in the order of uh, well, actually, I don't want to make up numbers. I don't know exactly how big the L two caches, but um, it's also nearby, but it's farther away, right? So like the L one cache might be like walking over to a bookshelf to grab some data. Uh, the L two cache might be like, oh man, it's not in the L one cache. Well, I'll look at the L two cache, uh, which might be like going into your closet and like digging through a box. Okay, so it's still here. It's still you know worth uh, going to. But um, you know, it, it wastes more time. So that's like ten cycles 
uh, of work that I could otherwise be doing, but I'm not doing because I had to read from the L2 cache. Okay, so the cache in for the CPU cache is really really important because it's basically like really close to the CPU, and as long as everything stays close to the CPU, I can get shit done really quickly. Okay, uh, because the CPU is fundamentally the thing that's executing your algorithm. It's like the person that's doing the stuff you're asking to get done. <clears throat> okay, so let's say it's not in any of the levels of the cache. So it might be like L1, L2, L3. Uh, they all, none of them have the data that I'm looking for, right? Let's say I'm looking for a book on war, on like the War of 1812. And it's not in my, on my desk, it's not in the closet, uh, it's also not in the bookshelf. Well, shit, then I gotta go to the library, okay? So the RAM is like the library, okay? The RAM is far away. <clears throat> takes about 800 cycles to go and access the RAM. These are very approximate numbers. So this is more, or, to consider this more order of magnitude because it depends on like a million things, the actual literal number of cycles. Um, but you can, you know, a good order of magnitude estimate is about 800. Uh, it's pretty far now, okay? RAM is really far away. Uh, so I gotta go get in my car, I gotta change, I gotta you know, do all this crap, I gotta go make sure my library card is renewed. Uh, but the RAM holds a shitload of data, right? So way more data that I can hold in the caches, way more data that I registers uh, it's like a giant library you know there's hallways of books uh, that I can go and read now the reality though is that when I read something from the RAM I can't just like take an entire bookshelf out of the RAM right I can only take so much stuff and actually get it into my house um, but it's all there okay the other thing about RAM so RAM is called random access memory uh, that's what RAM stands for and it's called random access because um, you can read from any part of the RAM as fast as you can read from any other part that's why it's called random access. So basically, uh, if you want to read, you know, the some element right over here, that takes the same amount of time as if you read some element that's like way at the end or way at the beginning or way somewhere three quarters into your into your RAM. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Kate says she missed that. As fast as you can read from what? Uh, I don't know the context of the sentence. Uh, can you maybe repeat the context where I said that? Um, oh, I said you can read from one part of the RAM as fast as you can read from any other part of the RAM. Um, so the RAM is sort of like this very, uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, you might imagine a real library, like to, to find like a really old book, I have to like go all the way to the back and like look through the whatever, something, something, right? I don't know. Um, but in, in the RAM, like you just walk up and you easily, like any book you can get as fast as any other. So that's one feature of the RAM that's worth, it's noteworthy, it's important. Um, so the RAM is like far away, going to the library, it sucks, okay? But the RAM is nothing compared to disk storage, right? If I'm going to the hard disk, uh, then I am, I am fucked, okay? That's like another country. Uh, on a solid state drive, which is like the fastest uh, general kind of uh, uh, hard, hard disk storage you're going to look at, uh, it's going to be about 5,000 computer cycles to read something from an SSD. Uh, and for an old school, drive like a, you know the old spindle drives like you know like a one of those uh big big fat ones that you probably had if you had a computer you know more than five years ago um then it's more like fifty thousand clock cycles to read from a spindle spindle drive um so it's really really slow this is like ordering a book from amazon from like a german backlog okay so this is like really really far away this can take ages to get to you uh, like there's so much you could be doing if you didn't have to read from disk you are literally wasting 50,000 instructions worth of stuff to do uh, because you're just waiting for this request from Amazon to, to get delivered to your house uh, and you cannot move on until then, right? So that's kind of the idea behind all these things is that as you're, you know, uh, the, the numbers that I'm, that I'm presenting are what you would do if you just sat there and waited for the read to come back. Like you couldn't move on until you read the data from memory. So, these, so it's important to understand this hierarchy and sort of the way the CPU is kind of far away from the RAM, from the L2, L1 cache, uh, and it's really close to the registers. <clears throat> so all data that you'll ever use in a program must really take a journey from the hard disk to eventually live inside of a register um, and actually have your CPU use it in some uh, you know, uh, functional way. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to come to the hard disk. It can go straight into memory, like for example, if you um, dynamically generated data that's not stored on disk. But the idea is like, you know, the data flows upward, closer and closer to the register. So you can actually do something with that data. Um, so does that make sense? Does everyone kind of follow? 
uh, sort of the, the hierarchy of data layers. <coughs> Any questions here? Uh, cool. All right, so everyone sounds like roughly good. Okay, so uh, let's look a little bit more deeply at memory. Okay, and here we're talking about uh, we can we can we might as well be talking about any kind of memory or any kind of data storage uh, other than registers. So this would be like <clears throat> also not including spindle drives. Spindle drives are a little different. Um, so this is talking about. Uh, uh, RAM, also talking about any caches, so L1, L2, L3 caches. Uh, and I believe SSDs are also random access, but I'm not sure. Um, but we'll talk about how memory is actually structured. What does it look like? Okay. So memory is just, just think about it as like a bunch of cells with shit in them. Okay? So it's like a bunch of binary stuff in a bunch of boxes, and they're all right next to each other. Okay? And it's lined up like that. It's like a giant spreadsheet just full of garbage. Okay? That is what memory looks like. Uh, it's not literally what it looks like, but it's how you should conceptualize uh, the memory. Okay. Uh, memory contains all binary data, meaning it's all zeros and ones. Okay, everything you've ever put in a computer, everything you've ever done on a computer, every you know thing you regrettable thing you've done on Snapchat, uh, they've all been binary data. They were all zeros and ones uh, that are stored somewhere in the memory of something. Um, so every data type: strings, floats objects, functions, whatever. They're all stored as binary data. Uh, that is how they're represented internally, uh, and that is how they live in memory. They live as some form of a binary serialization. The other thing is that it's also all stored contiguously. Okay, when I say contiguously, I mean right next to each other. Okay, and it's stored physically contiguously, meaning that uh, memory, that's like, uh, you know, let's say you have, you're storing like uh, a number, uh, another number, well, you're destroying a number. All of the bits that comprise that number are right next to each other. They're physically right there, just in a straight line. Okay. Uh, now, this is very important when it comes to arrays. Okay. The physical contiguity of memory is, is very important. Um, arrays are just contiguous blocks of memory. That's all they are. Arrays are just like a slab of memory. Okay. Um, that is why arrays are so fast. And it might not be obvious that arrays are fast. You might, this might come as a somewhat surprise over other data types. Uh, but arrays are, in fact, sort of the first class object of any algorithm because they are the fastest data structure, uh, because they're also the most primitive, they're the most basic. They are just slabs of memory right next to each other. Um, so let's look at an array. Okay, so this is what an array looks like. Um, so we can imagine this array that's uh, you know, it's called A, and this array uh, has these four slots. Uh, the four is cut off for some reason, but it's got you know, zero, one, two, three, and four. Now, uh, uh, and so all memory, one thing to note about memory is all memory has an address. Uh, that's just a way that like for the computer to do bookkeeping to know where, you know, what's what, right? So it's just like a street address. Uh, they're all unique. And uh, I mean, we're, we're gonna ignore like virtual memory and stuff like that for the moment. And <clears throat> it's important to note that like, when the computer allocates for you an array, it tells you, okay, your array starts here, and it goes this many slots, okay? And the computer guarantees for you, when you ask for memory to, create, to construct this array, in JavaScript, you don't really ask for memory, but in any, uh, so you know, the JavaScript compiler will, uh, or the runtime, will ask for memory when it executes in C, or in C++, or, or whatever language. Um, so that it will say, hey, uh, you know, computer, uh, or, you know, uh, operating system, will you give me five slots, because I want this array from zero to four, which you know, zero next and every five slots. Uh, and the CPU is like, cool, or it's not the CPU, sorry, the OS is like, cool, here you go. Here's the base address. So here's the address at which you start. You have five slots. Don't touch anything outside of it, because I can't guarantee you what that stuff is. Okay. So anything outside of these five uh, slots in memory are, for all I know, garbage. They either belong to other programs or they're like other things that are the variables in my program. Uh, there could be garbage values that are just sitting there. Uh, I don't know what the hell they are. And without knowing what they are, I'm really doing with them. So I'm just going to not touch them. Okay, so then I don't know what the hell's in there. I'm just going to ignore it. All I know is about my array. Uh, and have, you know, if you're using like a uh, high level language like JavaScript or uh, you know Python or something like that, then this is something you never get to touch, right? You have no ability to actually like go out of bounds of your array. Uh, but in a program like C, or a programming 
language like C that's very low level, you actually can't do this. Um, and it's a very bad thing, and a lot of horrible errors happen because C exposes to you literally just these memory addresses, right? You can just go in and put stuff into addresses and move around wherever you want, uh, so long as you don't seg fault. So, <clears throat> uh, so assume that each of these cells are eight bytes, okay? Just because uh, that's just the easiest way to think about it, right? Uh, and so we've got this. Uh, imagine their address uh, this way. Is that you know you just show these little numbers? Basically, every address is like a bit. Um, so Roger asked what actually causes the seg fault. Uh, let's not worry about that. It's actually somewhat complicated. Uh, I'd encourage you just Wikipedia it. Uh, it. It kind of involves a lot of memory management stuff, uh, which is really outside the scope of like a language like JavaScript to worry about. Um, <clears throat> so, what, uh, so all of these numbers are separated by sixty-four. Uh, usually when you represent memory, you use hexadecimal, but I'm just using decimal here. Um, so all these numbers are separated by 64 because the idea is that there's eight bytes or 64 bits between each of these blocks of memory. Okay, The number of bits, number of bytes don't really matter. Don't worry about that. That's not something important. The important point is that like they're all the same distance apart. Okay, There's no, uh, every like it, it's super, super regular. They're all like just these chunks and they're exactly this big and that's just how it is. Okay. Um, each cell is offset by exactly 64 in the address space because there's 64 bits in each, inside of each cell in memory. Um, the, what this means is that you can very easily derive the address of any index just knowing the start address. Okay. Uh, hopefully you have some intuition why this is. Um, but what it it looks like a function to actually get the thing, this is sort of like a it's kind of pseudocode sort of thing, um, to actually determine the address that you need to load from. So you need to like make this load command, which a CPU knows how to do. It's a sort of primitive uh, CPU operation to load something into a register. Um, it will just take the start address, which it knows because the array knows its start address. It's sort of like, that's why this, this dot start address equals whatever, whatever. Um, take the start address, add, I multiplied by 64. So basically the index times whatever the size of each cell, right? Uh, and you can verify for yourself that if I put three into that function as I, then I will get, you know, 833096, uh, which is the start address, plus three times 64, which is 192. Add those two together, I get 833288, which is exactly the value of A3, right? And of course, if I is equal to zero, that is actually the reason why we use zero indexing. If you ever wondered why zero indexing, this is why. Uh, to make this math easy and really fast, uh, which is part of what makes arrays really fast, because that happens so often. Um, so basically, if the array is structured exactly like this, which all arrays are, then just by knowing the index and doing some really quick math, I, can, I know exactly the address that I need to load from to load something, basically to do like, R at index I, or to look up the value of an, of, uh, uh, an index in an array. Uh, just by doing a quick set of, a quick uh, math calculation, I can figure it out like that. Whoops, uh, this is pointer arithmetic. Okay, it's called pointer arithmetic because the address is a pointer. Uh, that, is, that is what pointers are, pointers are just addresses in memory. Uh, and so by adding numbers together, just by adding numbers, not knowing anything about the size of the array, it doesn't matter if the array was size 10 billion, 10 million, 5, 20, just by doing that math, just by solving that math problem, uh, which is very, very easy for a computer to do, um, I can get the exact value of the load out of memory. Uh, and that is pointer arithmetic, and pointer arithmetic is what makes array lookups a one. Because the CPU load instruction is uh, so when the CPU loads something, it needs to know what cell in memory to load from. Um, calculate that just by doing this math in a one time. Um, and because an array is stored contiguously, because an array is stored exactly like this, end to end, it's, it's the thing in zero goes in zero, the thing in one goes in one, um, that is why pointer arithmetic works. If you have a data structure that's not stored like this, okay, and objects, for example, or hash maps are not stored like this, um, you know, if you had a linked list, a linked list is not stored like this. If you had, uh, you, you might think like, well, what if I had an array, but one of the elements took up two slots, right? One of the elements took up three slots. If you did uh, any kind of, uh, you know, 
janky stuff like that, uh, then point arithmetic would not work anymore because you would need to know more about where things lived to like know what the offsets were of how to find stuff. Does that make sense? Did people uh, understand why, this is really important, do people understand why point arithmetic allows arrays, array lookups to be fast? And if you, if you break that, uh, if, you, if you sort of break these invariants of an array, uh, array lookups are not fast. They're only fast because of uh, point arithmetic. So you don't necessarily have to understand the point arithmetic itself. You don't have to be able to do this. You obviously never would if you're using something like JavaScript. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it's very, very uh, important to see why these things are fast. And we're gonna, it's going to come back to us when we talk about cache efficiency or what makes uh, algorithms cache efficient. Um, cool. Uh, this is also the reason why arrays are by far the fastest uh, data structure. So Stephen Rock asking you, can I compare it to uh, what I compared it to? I think I compared it to a linked list, and uh, <clears throat> I think the heap object lookup. Oh, uh, looking up objects in a hash map. I think that might have been what you were referring to, or looking up in like a JavaScript object. Um, uh, maybe maybe not understanding your question, Stephen. So Roger asks, how are dynamic arrays handled? So dynamic arrays are a little bit different. Uh, dynamic arrays are basically like a class or an object that wraps around a static array that's just like this. Okay. So it, so you're absolutely right. In JavaScript, uh, you have dynamic arrays, which means that they can grow, be arbitrarily big. You know, you can call dot length and not as before, uh, and they can, you know they, you don't have to decide ahead of time how big the array is. Um, what JavaScript is doing for you is just wrapping around a primitive array. That is actually doing all this stuff. Like you know, the primitive array is exactly like this, um, but there's a sort of object-oriented uh, interface over it. And when it grows too big, it'll allocate a new array instead of, to sort of copy everything over instead of the old one. Um, if you're curious, I would I would try to build a dynamic array. It's a really really good uh, coding exercise to understand the data structure better. Um, it's quite hard, especially if you implement it with a circular buffer to make all of the uh, like push pop shift and shift all one, which you actually can do. Uh, JavaScript does not do that, but uh, some languages do uh, implement arrays where shift and unshift are also a one. Uh, but in JavaScript, unshifting is one because it does not use a circular. Um, cool. Okay, so array lookups are o one, and this is why arrays are super fast. Any algorithm that you have, you want to use an array if you can. If you can, you can't always, but if you can, prefer an array. It's much faster. So if there's ever a situation where like, oh, I could put this in a hash map or I could put it in an array, put it in an array. Arrays are going to be faster. Uh, and if your input size is bounded, so let's say, you know, um, so one example actually, if you remember, uh, let's go back to it. Uh, if you remember the, what was it, cache efficiency? Bottleneck. Okay, here we go. Uh, this unique letters thing, right? Uh, some people talk about using hash map or an object to store the unique letters. Uh, so we only have to do an O1 lookup, right? Uh, people might remember this. <clears throat> uh, Roger asks if you write a more efficient shift and unshift yourself. Um, you could not do that for the JavaScript array as it is. You have to re-implement the way the JavaScript works. Um, so you could, you could, but you have to write a new array. You could not use like a JavaScript array and just augment it. Um, you'd have to write like sort of a new array that wraps around JavaScript array. Um, if, you, if you're curious, ask me about more about it later. Um, so you, you might have thought like, well, you know. Okay, this thing is bounded by size 26. If we assume that unique letters is always 26 at most, um, you could say that, well, uh, let's just make it a hash map so that it's 01, right? Um, but in fact, it actually might well, and I suspect it probably is, faster to just do this, to literally just have an array. Uh, because like arrays are so much faster than hash maps uh, because there's so much other code that has to run, uh, so much other just like crap that happens and pointers that have to be uh, trace down in a hash map uh, that a lot of times for small input sizes, arrays outperform hash maps. Um, so this is probably a case where I, I suspect that an array would actually perform faster than a hash map would. Um, I'm not 100% sure, it could be pretty close, but uh, there's definitely a threshold where uh, for small fixed input sizes, arrays outperform hash maps, um, even for you know sizable uh, inputs. Okay, so. That is, uh, that's that. We're now going to wrap up by talking about cache efficiency. 
Uh, before I move on, this is the last part. We're almost done. Um, any questions so far uh, that relate to anything that we've just uh, covered on uh, arrays and memory? So hopefully you guys have some understanding now of why array lookup is 01. Um, it's also the same reason why setting a value in array is 01, because the uh, writing to memory is also just a, you know, a sort of a tonic operation that the CPU can do. Uh, it just needs to know a memory address. <clears throat> Any questions? Questions, questions? Like, quick check-in, quick check-in. Like, how, how are people feeling? I'm tired, this is like getting pretty long. Uh, how are we how are we holding up? I just I just want to get a sense of like how people are feeling right now because it's tough because I can't, can't see anybody and so it's hard to really get much feedback. Uh, right, let me answer some of these questions. Hopefully, if people can answer. That'd be great. Um, do, 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 I'd like to hear more about an example of array efficiency versus hash map efficiency. Um, yeah, let me let me bracket that because it's hard to actually have. So most of the time, for large inputs, anytime you're talking about asymptotically, uh, large inputs is great. Uh, I'm sorry, hash maps are, are much better because they're 0, 1, 1. Um, for To like find something in a hash map is always 0, 1 time. Uh, not always, but average 0, 1 time. Uh, in an array, it's O, N. Um, cool, yeah, if you guys got to sign off, you know, no big deal. Uh, we, we should be wrapping up pretty soon, though, so I'll try to make sure that we move the rest of this uh, at a timely pace. Um, yeah, so so for large inputs, hash maps are usually going to be better, or pretty much always going to be better. Uh, but for small inputs, arrays often outperform hash maps. But it's kind of like, remember, if you remember that graph that I looked at before, where like the all the lines intersect each other kind of crazily at the bottom left? Uh, I'm talking about like in the bottom left area right now of that graph. So as the numbers get big, never again is an array as good as a hash map for finding arbitrary values. Uh, Joanne asks, what's the second fastest data type? Uh, that's uh, kind of, I don't really know how to answer that question. Because, uh, like, there's really not much. I mean, I don't know how you, I don't really know. I mean, because, like, an array is such a primitive. Like, it's such a simple thing. I mean, like a string, I guess. But a string is just an, another version of an array. It's an array of characters. Um, so yeah, like, I don't know how you'd really, like, decide another data type. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that question. Uh, uh, ask, is lookup and setting ON across all languages, or just JavaScript? Uh, lookup and setting, I don't know what you're referring to as lookup and setting. And it's also, I don't think it's ON. So if you refer to like object lookup in an in object literal, that's O1, not ON. Um, maybe maybe I'm, I wasn't enunciating very clearly. It's O1. Um, so it's constant time. And uh, that that'd be true in any language that implements it correctly. Same thing with like assigning a variable, looking up a variable. Uh, Chris asks, what else uses pointer arithmetic? Um, pretty much nothing, just arrays. If you don't have an array, if it's not structured exactly the way that an array is structured, um, then you can use pointer arithmetic because you can't assume that everything is at a fixed interval. Uh, Roger Beeman asks, it's like tangent, but how do SSDs store memory? Uh, I don't actually know that. I don't know very much about SSDs or about hardware to storage. Um, so they don't, st you wouldn't they store memory because it's not memory, it's more hard storage because memory means that, you know, once you turn off the power, it goes out, right? So like it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, anyways, memory is not persistent past a power cycle. Uh, right. SSD is persistent, right? Like if you turn your computer off, your SSD still has everything on it. So you wouldn't call that memory, uh, but I don't actually know how SSDs are implemented. So that's, that's a cool question, I'll look into that. <clears throat> okay, let's move on. I know you guys are getting tired. I'm getting tired too, so let's try to wrap this up. All right, so let's talk about caching. Caches are dumb. Okay, this is very important. Caches are stupid. They're 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 not very intelligent. Um, now I say that obviously somewhat tongue in cheek, but uh, I want you to understand where this is coming from. So here we got the CPU, we got the caches, and we got the RAM. So what I was talking about I was talking about like CPU, you know, lives in its own little palace. Cache is like, you know, it's library, it's closet, and whatever. And then the RAM is like really far away, okay? When the CPU needs data, it first looks into the cache. And it says, hey, cache, do you have, like, I need a address, you know, 3,020 million and eight or whatever, I don't know, whatever, something, some number. Uh, do you have that? And the cache, uh, let's say it's not in the cache. So the cache responds no, okay? This is called a cache miss. A uh, cache hit is when you do, when you do find the thing in the cache, and you just 
get it directly from the cache. Uh, but if it's not in the cache, if CPU asks for it and it's not there, then this is called a cache miss. Uh, and so basically the CPU then delegates to the cache uh, because the cache needs to go and ask the next cache. Uh, so you know, the L1 cache would ask the L2 cache, like, hey, L2 cache, do you have something? The CPU is asking. The CPU, the CPU, you know, L2 cache would be like, no. And so the L2 cache asks the L3 cache and so on. Let's say all the caches say no. And so the L3 cache is like, hey, RAM, I need you, buddy. Like, can you? You get the such and such data, uh, you know, L2 cache is asking for it, and the L1 and CPU, et cetera. So the cache then loads the data the CPU requested from the RAM. The, RAM, the CPU asks for one memory address. Right? It asks for, I want the byte, so the eight bits that's exactly here in the RAM. Right? Um, now the cache is like, okay, cool, I'll, I'll load that for you because you asked for it. But I know you. I know you and your reading habits, right? Like I, when you get into those war books, like you want to read every book on the War of eighteen twelve, uh, because you're just you're just that kind of guy. You're just you know whatever. Uh, so because I know you, and I don't want to just like go on a round trip for no reason, uh, I'm going to go ahead and like grab a shitload of books from that bookshelf. Um, that's like just you know very local nearby data or. Books because I don't want to have to make multiple round trips. If you were like, "Oh, I like this book. I want the follow up by the same author." I'm like, "I'll just, you know, I'll just get the one by the same author um, because I know that you'll ask for more later." So, <clears throat> in other words, when the cache loads data and sort of puts memory puts uh, data into the cache, um, it assumes because the CPU is only asking for one memory address, the cache kind of tries to be smart about it, uh, but it's not too smart. Uh, it just assumes that related data to the data that you asked for, or sort of related books to the book that you checked out, will just be around the same physical area, at least in the same neighborhood, right? The same bookshelf. Um, and so what it does, uh, so you can say that it assumes locality of data, okay? It just assumes that all the stuff that you're probably going to want to read after this will probably be around here. It's just a good, it's just a good heuristic, right? This is a good rule of thumb. Probably will be in the same area. So the cache just takes a big chunk just grabs like a bookshelf and just drags the entire bookshelf back to the cache. Okay, so it just takes this big contiguous chunk of data. It's physically contiguous, meaning it's right next to each other. In the, okay. Okay. Cool. So this probably makes sense so far. Uh, so so what? Well, how does it, what is it matter? Why am I telling this? Um, remember this part. This this graph right here. Loading from memory is really really. Okay, and we want to minimize the number of cache misses because remember, like the number of cycles uh, that are wasted when we load something from the RAM is like it's a really, really large number compared to looking up something in the cache. So if I can get the next time the CPU wants to read something, if it doesn't have to go on a full trip all the way to the RAM, then that's great. It saves a lot of time down the road, right? So like, so this time, okay, yeah, first I go and take. A Right. But ideally, like you can just read everything from your bookshelf now. You just checked out all the right books from the library. Um, so the way that you take advantage of this is by keeping your data local and keeping your data structures contiguous, meaning you keep them physically next to each other. Okay. Uh, now your programs already do this. Your programs are already smart. Like your system and the way your programs are written, they are already smart enough to know that uh, caches assume locality of data, meaning that they assume all the data that's related that's going to be used in the same breath or the same you know, 10 minutes is going to be close by in memory. And they know that the cache does this kind of dumb thing where it just grabs this, like big block of data and just puts it in the cache so that if the CPU later wants to read more of the same stuff, it's just right there ready to go. Um, so what this means, though, is that arrays are king. This is why arrays are so, so good, because they're perfect for caches. Because all of the data is literally right next to each other in memory, okay. So like this is literally what an array looks like. Under it's just it's just right next to each other. And if the cache does this dumb caching strategy, uh, you will grab the entire array all at once. You will never have to get this. like it'll all be right there, and it'll all probably also bubble up the different cache layers so that it goes up the L3 cache up to the L2 cache up to the L1 cache and stays there as you're working within the same like you know very tight works. Of memory. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, an algorithm that jumps around in memory or follows a bunch of pointers to other objects will do the opposite of that. 
that will trigger a bunch of cache misses because you know so you can imagine that like the uh the um the cpu is going to load this memory address but then it's going to like a pointer to another object that lives somewhere else it's not an array it's not local uh and so that other object lives way over here so it triggers another cache miss uh, and that lives over here and that points something lives over here and that points something lives over here uh, and so every time that i follow a pointer there's no guarantee that the other object that the pointer is pointing to is located nearby and so what that means is that i'm going to trigger cache messages and that triggers this long back and forth trip to the ram uh, and that's really really slow okay so what has pointers well think of data structures like, like linked lists uh, trees, even hash maps, follow pointers. Okay, uh, linked lists are the sort of the, the, pr the prime evil example, uh, where basically you know linked lists are just a bunch of objects, it's just link objects, and they each point to a next, right, uh, a next link in the chain. And to get to that next, well, that's just like you know it's a it's a reference to another object, which is just a pointer to another object. And so to follow the pointer, to load the object that it's pointing to, you've got to load from a different RAM address. So this is this line here going through the RAM, that's exactly what traversing a linked list looks like. You bounce here, then you bounce here, then you bounce here, then you bounce here, then you bounce here, and they are all likely to trigger cache misses. Uh, and that's why traversing a linked list, even though it's still ON, and traversing an array is still ON, traversing a linked list is much slower than traversing an array uh, for that reason. And same thing with the hash map. If you have a hash map with the same number of elements as an array, you know, and it has like even be like the indexes in the array, right? Um, the hash map will be much slower for iterating uh, for the same reason. The hash map jumps around. There are these pointers that it has to chase. Um, so ideally, you want to work locally within arrays of contiguous data. Uh, so now we're going to do a quick exercise. Actually, one more thing I want to add is that if you Note uh, the three famous sorting algorithms uh, that are n log n, comparison based sorting algorithms uh, quick sort, merge sort, and keep sort. The fastest of the three is quick sort. Merge sort is medium, pretty good. Keep sort is really, really bad. Okay. And uh, it might not be obvious why heap sort is bad. You might not be familiar with heap sort, by the way, probably a good chance you aren't. Uh, if, you are, if you are not familiar with it, I'd encourage you to go read up on it. Uh, but actually, one of the reasons why heap sort is so slow is because it's very cache inefficient. It jumps around a lot. Even though it uses arrays, it jumps around a lot within the same array. Uh, whereas quicksort is really, really good staying local in the way that it works through an array and sorts it. And if you look at like a visualization of heap sort or, or quicksort, you'll see that. Uh, so I encourage you to like look up a visualization of these algorithms and you'll see why, you'll get an intuition. If they stay local and they stay within the same general area for a long amount of time and don't jump around, a lot and trigger a lot of cache misses, then the algorithm is likely to perform pretty well. Uh, any questions about that before we jump into the uh, the uh, uh, Cody adds a link there. I don't know what that's to, but I assume it's probably good visualizations of sorting algorithms. Um, any questions here on cache efficiency before we jump into the exercise? <clears throat> yes, thank you, Cody. Awesome. Any other questions? This is going to be the last exercise, so we're almost good to go. Um, so uh, Joe Willie asks, why would you ever use a linked list over an array? Uh, there is usually not a reason. Uh, linked lists are almost always strictly worse than arrays. Uh, uh, there are a few things, like so, so some arrays, like the array implement JavaScript, do not allow fast unshift. Uh, arrays you can, or linked lists, you can unshift really quickly. Um, you can augment an array, though, to have a fast uh, unshift. So that's kind of a bullshit thing. Uh, there are some things that you only can use a linked list for. Um, so it's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture to talk about, but there are some things that, uh, yes, yeah, so Ned points that caches are built upon linked lists. They absolutely are. Uh, you cannot build a fast cache without a linked list. Uh, but they're very, they're generally pretty few applications that can only use a linked list. For the most part, arrays are almost strictly superior to linked lists. Uh, so Roger Bowman asks, so this is a measurement comparison between O1 tasks. So yes, absolutely correct. So uh, basically, usually cache efficiency is a constant factor, but it's a very real one, right? So like all of the sorting algorithms I mentioned, uh, NLG, uh, uh, or sorry, not NLG, what did I say? Merge sort, quick sort, and heap sort, they are all NLG, but quick sort is like much faster than heap sort. Um, 
and it's because of cache efficiency. So cache efficiency can raise the efficiency of an algorithm by like 10x or even 100x, depending on how cache efficient uh, another version of the algorithm is. Now that's still constant, but in the real world, it ends up meaning quite a lot. And so there's some algorithms that might have like good quote unquote time complexity, but their, uh, their cache efficiency is so bad that they're just not realistically usable. Uh, so if you want to like speed up an algorithm and make it more efficient, uh, then cache efficiency really makes a difference. Um, and actually, here's a really interesting turn out. I, I loved this when I first learned this. Um, so it turned out, so quicksort is like the pretty much the fastest uh, uh, fastest uh, algorithm for sorting. And uh, but it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that that quicksort was preferred. In fact, in the early days of computing, heap sort was actually the preferred sort. And the reason why is that quicksort actually has a logarithmic space because it uses recursion. Um, uh, or if you don't use recursion, you still have to manually manage a stack. Um, but uh, heap sort actually has O1 space. So heap sort takes less space than quicksort does. Um, but that eventually changed. Heap sort used to be the, heap sort used to be the preferred uh, sorting uh, algorithm, but that changed with the advent of caches. Before caches came around, like the fact that we're talking about cache efficiency right now is only true because of the way that hardware is architected now, right? This is really kind of out of the bounds of computer science. It's more like the intersection between computer science and like hardware engineering, right? Like this is like why, why we have to care about caches is because of hardware. Um, because caches became so big and became so close to the machine, you can actually start taking advantage of them. And algorithms that normally were like performing around the same time the ones that, because you know, the cache initially was so small that it didn't really make a difference whether your algorithm was local or not, because there was, you just couldn't put that much in the cache. But now caches are huge relative to what they used to be, and so now it really, really matters. So algorithms that used to be once pretty formant on old computers, uh, they're not anymore, right? Like quicksort just way outperforms heap sort now because of how big and how useful caches are. So I just thought that was a really cool tidbit that I always enjoyed. Uh, last question. Uh, Danny asked, if, if an array is contiguous in memory, what happens if you push another one and there's no memory slot to add it? Does it move the whole array? So in a primitive array, you just can't push anything new on there. Um, in a dynamic array that wraps around a primitive array, like what JavaScript has, uh, it'll literally just create a new array and put everything there. And the array will just be bigger by some uh, constant multiple. So, uh, cool. Let's do a quick exercise. So this is our last exercise of the day. Oh, whoops. Okay. Uh, so this file is cacheefficiency.js, right? So uh, let's, uh, if someone can post a link to this, that would be, uh, I think, really helpful for a lot of people. Um, so just uh, run through this file, read through the comments, see if you can make sure, uh, make sense of what it's doing. And uh, we're going to try to make this thing more cache efficient and see how much faster we can make it. Uh, so go ahead and jump in here, see if you can solve this problem, and this will show you sort of a real world example of cache efficiency. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I just posted it into the chat. Whew. Man, that's a lot of talking. Okay. Let's kill this for a second. All right. Yeah, we were just about done. Awesome. So we give ourselves a few minutes to work through that. <clears throat> Someone in a blue hoodie is leaving. I feel, I feel very sad. <clears throat> I'm sorry, blue hoodie guy. I wish I could be better to you. <clears throat> okay, so Roger Beeman asks, uh, so our stacks actually objects then. Um, so our stacks actually objects. Um, and yes, they are definitely objects. Uh, so stack is just a um, the stack is an abstract data type. A stack is an abstract data type, basically meaning that it doesn't actually require a specific data structure. So you can implement a stack using different data structures. So you can implement a stack with a linked list, you can implement a stack with an array, you can implement a stack with you know, a lot of other stuff that probably would not be the smartest thing to do in the world, but you could. Um, <clears throat> so the standard implementation of a stack is using an array. Um, 
I'm not sure if that answers your question because I, I might not actually understand what your question is. <clears throat> ah, okay, okay. Yes, so when you have a dynamic array, so an array that is not sort of statically sized, right, uh, that can grow and get bigger. <clears throat> oh, it looks like my video just went out. Uh, can people still hear me? Am I still audible? Okay. Uh, let me try refreshing. I don't know why my video just went out. Okay, let's take them back. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so uh, as you guys are working through that last problem, so if, if you have a, a, a static array and you push onto it and there's no more room in the underlying memory, then usually what will happen is at the, at the level of the uh, object wrapper that you have around this array, so you have like some class like a dynamic array or, you know, in JavaScript there's a, some kind of wrapper with an API with all these functions for arrays, like the function prototype uh, that defines how push and pop and everything work. Um, what that will do is it'll see, oh, hey, I, I'm, I've run out of space in my underlying array, and so I need to create a new one. So what it'll do is it'll create a new array, uh, but like you rightly point out, if I if I push it somewhere not contiguous, then array or, uh, point arithmetic doesn't work anymore, right? So what it has to do is it has to copy everything from the old array one by one into the new array. So that's actually the reason why if you have a dynamic array, uh, um, the worst case for pushing is ON. Uh, because you might trigger a resize of the underlying array if it runs out of space. Um, <clears throat> now, the average case is still O1, and it's pretty complicated analysis why that is, so I'm maybe going to head away from that a little bit. Uh, but you can, you can look up and read about it if you're really curious. Uh, Okay, uh, maybe show of uh, show of text. How many people are good to go over? Uh, answer how many people are still trying to figure things out. One hand. <laughs> One hand. Okay, we got a couple hands. Uh, okay, a well, hand from the side. I like it. I like the hand from the side. Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, so let's let's go ahead and, and run through things. I know people want to go home. So, uh, okay, let's see here. Do, 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 do. What do I got? Um, i to share my screen again. Okay, entire screen. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> uh, wait, is that working? Did I just die? Uh, can anyone see my screen? Oh, oh, whoops. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. There you go. All right, back to back to the infinite mirrors. Okay, uh, my apologies. Okay, so uh, all right. So what are we doing here? So we're creating a huge matrix, right? So there's this huge make huge matrix utility right here that just makes a giant matrix that's size, you know, n by n. Okay. So here I'm passing in ten thousand because that's like a reasonably large number. Um, and now what I'm doing is I'm iterating through this in a cache inefficient way. Um, and so inside of here I just access the element that's there. Okay, you can see here, because I uh, iterate through every i and j, I'm going to touch every single element in here, and I'm just going to like look at it and then throw it away and not do anything with it. Uh, JavaScript will still execute this code, just, just because you told it to. Um, so this is cache inefficient, and it might not be obvious why, uh, but you can see here when I iterate slowly through this big matrix, uh, I'm going to run this code here. Uh, let's see. No, no, no. um, and this is cache efficiency, so node cache efficiency. Uh, and so it's timing how long it takes to uh, iterate through this uh, array, and it takes 4,154 milliseconds. Okay, so not, not, not super good. Uh, and this, this matrix isn't that big, like it's 10,000 by 10,000, which for a computer should be totally doable. But those of you who are astute, anyone want to take a shot at like how you make this thing more uh, cache efficient? <clears throat> uh, 
So Stephen Rock says one array. Uh, well, but it's a matrix. I want a matrix. I want to iterate through a matrix in a fast efficient way. So you're absolutely right. If I made the whole thing one array and just compounded it all together. Uh, ah, Cormac has it. Row first traversal. So if I flip these around, I j instead of j i. Let's now run this. And it takes a tenth of the time, 438 milliseconds, as opposed to 4,000. Okay, so just by switching those two variables around, somehow I got a 10x increase in speed. Okay? Anybody want to take a guess why? Why did that happen? Ah, Brian's got it. Because the row is held in the cache, right? So the row, the actual, so remember, matrix of I, just like this thing. So if I say, you know, uh, let row equals matrix of I, this is one row. This is like one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, up to 10,000, okay? And then what I'm doing is I'm iterating through that row from zero up to 10,000, right? So that basically, the row gets loaded into the cache, and then I iterate through that row, and there are very few cache misses because I'm moving left to right in memory. If I do it the other way, then if I do matrix ij, then what happens is on each iteration, uh, so it's a little bit harder to, I guess, show, but like uh, on each iteration, it's like matrix j i, right? i is always the same. So basically, i is always going to be zero on the first iteration. So it's like matrix j, uh, so like matrix zero, zero, then matrix one, zero, then matrix two, zero. So I keep accessing different arrays, right? Matrix zero is a different array. Matrix two is a different array. Matrix three is a different array. And they, there's no guarantee that all the arrays are actually right next to each other in memory. They're not. The array itself is contiguous, but all this, like, this array of a bunch of arrays, this is an array of a pointers, oh, sorry, an array of pointers to other arrays. Right. Once I actually start looking from left to right through the array, then I'm in that array. That array is in the cache, and it all bubbles up to the L1 cache, and like it's super fast to read through it. But if I keep jumping from array to array to array to array to array, instead of jumping within the same array from element to element to element to element to element, that allows me to make this more cache efficient. And that makes this in a, like an order of magnitude faster just by switching the order in which I'm traversing this matrix. Does that make sense? People, people follow like why that why that's happening. So this is like this is an example at the algorithm level or like at the actual you know coding level of how the mechanisms inside your computer, the uh, the L1 cache, the L2 cache, the L3 cache, how they all work inside of your machine are affecting the way your programming is running. Your sorry, your program is running. Because um, all this stuff matters. All this stuff makes a difference. And the little things that you can do to make your algorithms more cache efficient. Um, can, I mean, again, asymptotically, they don't matter because they'll never change the, you know, uh, uh, the big O or the asymptotic runtime of your algorithm, but they will definitely give you a significant speed up if you can be smarter about making your data local and, you know, taking advantage of locality of data in the way that you uh, execute your code. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Any questions on this? Uh, so this is just cache efficiency. Um, that's generally what, what's, what it's known as. Uh, yes. Any other questions on this specifically? Cool. I'm, I'm getting compliments. I feel special. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's... Um, let me quickly run through. Actually, I'm going to kind of skip a slide and then we're going to go back to Q&A. Okay. Uh, just because I know a lot of people want to leave and it's uh, probably fairly late in New York City. Um, so just quick about me, I am Haseeb. Uh, my name is Haseeb Qureshi. Uh, you might have uh, heard about me from a blog post thing that went viral from my website, uh, HaseebQ.com. Find me on Twitter, at Haseeb. Uh, I also, I guess you guys all have access to my GitHub because you guys have uh, seen it there. Uh, I work at Airbnb, started working here a couple months ago, uh, and I used to be uh, an instructor at App Academy, which is a coding bootcamp in San Francisco. Um, this whole event is uh, for charity. This is not, no one is making any money off of this. Uh, and I agreed to do this if uh, people would, uh, or if the New York JavaScript group would donate the proceeds to the Against Malaria Foundation. 
Okay. So if you got something out of this, if you have money to spare, uh, please donate. Uh, it's actually, oh, cool. I can, there's a button that says prompt for contribution. I'm going to do that. It says prompt successful. Was anyone prompted? Did people receive a prompt for uh, contributions? Um, yeah. So uh, if you if you dug this, if you thought this was cool, if you got something out of it, if you learned something, uh, please donate. You know, uh, ten twenty dollars to the Against Malaria Foundation. Uh, it's actually ranked by GiveWell, which is a charity evaluator, as uh, the most efficient and effective charity in the world. So um, you can, for three dollars, you can uh, buy an antimalarial bed net for somebody in uh, mostly sub-Saharan Africa and prevent them from contracting malaria, which is one of the most deadly diseases in the world, um, and it's really awesome. And uh, yeah, please, please, please donate. Uh, cool, so now that we've got that out of the way, questions. It's Q&A time. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, bump my face back up here so you guys can see a real human being. Um, and um, thank you so much, everybody, for coming out, and uh, I'll now take questions for like, however long until I get too tired to keep answering questions. You're very welcome, Arnaud. So Ned asks, is there a meaning beyond big O when companies say scalability in the job description? Uh, kind of, there might be. So, <clears throat> so big O is a way of analyzing algorithms, right? Um, but when, when companies talk about scaling systems, uh, very often a lot of that is not just algorithms, right? So it might also be hardware, it might also be, you know, knowing different technologies that scale better than others, uh, like different databases, for example, scale better than others. So uh, they might be saying, you know, um, if we're looking for someone who has experience with scaling a database, might be like, okay, we use like a SQL database and we want to learn, we want to like migrate over to a distributed database. We need someone who knows about scaling databases. In that case, they're not really talking about big O. They don't really care if you notice bright an algorithm. They know whether you know how to like do database migrations and like manage a distributed system, which is, kind of a very different set of topics. Um, so Big O is something that will be more likely asked at bigger companies uh, or you know, companies that are very CS focused. Um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of companies that talk about scaling. They don't actually they don't actually say Big O as much as they are about like human like code and like, oh, yeah, do yeah, actual, yeah, actual yeah, real life systems that will solve uh, problems that I you know, presumably care about at my company. Uh, so Roger Bayman asked, do you know any resources on the big O of native JS methods? I do not, unfortunately. Uh, I, I do know, I mean, so, you know, uh, V8, the standard, you know, the, the node JavaScript runtime and what is used in Chrome, uh, is open source, so you can go read it. Uh, I presume there are docs somewhere out there that actually show you the source code for different, uh, methods and functions, but I have not really gone through them myself, so I don't know for sure. Um, but chances are... You can look up and, and I mean, for the most part, V8 is very, very optimized, so it's very good. So you can usually assume that like whatever is the optimal algorithm that you can find anywhere on the internet for, uh, like let's say you want to know like what is the running time of like reduce, right? Uh, you can probably just look up like you know what's the you know, just look up on Stack Overflow what is the runtime of reduce, and we'll say oh it's ON. You're like, okay, well JavaScript's probably doing it in ON time because JavaScript was written by very very smart people. Uh, over a long period of time, and V8 is the best JavaScript engine, so you, know, you can kind of put some faith in that. Uh, Brian says, of all the things discussed today, what do you think are the most important while interviewing uh, and possibly different while actually on the job? Whew, okay, that's a tough question. Um, so I'd say, I mean, almost certainly a go is, one of the, is probably the most important. It's so like just being able to do asymptotic analysis, look at an algorithm, figure out what the actual runtime of that algorithm is. That is uh, for sure the biggest one. Um, so uh, that's the majority of what you're gonna be using in an actual interview. Uh, things like cache efficiency show up sometimes, uh, probably definitely more rarely. Um, and just knowing about arrays, I think a lot of this just really helps in like tying everything together and really understanding like why a lot of algorithms make the choices they make or why algorithms Kind of are the way they are. Um, so, you know, I'd be pretty surprised if somebody asked you, like, you know, tell me about the L1 cache or the L2 cache. Um, but I think it's really, really helpful to have that understanding about like the architecture of a computer because it just helps you think about it better. You know, uh, helps you kind of understand the different things that go on with a 
with a with a computer. Um, so Donnie or Danny, uh, Donnie, Danny uh, asks, uh, "Thanks so much to see you. I loved having exercise to try related to these concepts. Um, so often these ideas are taught with no practical application. Thank you. I don't know that I provided that much practical application, but I'm glad you think so. Uh, I think this is still pretty abstract, but." Um, you're very welcome. I'm glad you guys enjoyed the exercises. Um, oh, no sound? Sound is dead? Uh, Camilla says no sound. Do you guys have sound? There is sound for you. Okay, cool. Um, awesome. Okay, so I guess some people have sound. Uh, so Matt O, is I see an explanation of JavaScript as opposed to the commonly found big O stuff in Simplicity and Java? Yeah. So, you know, when I was learning most of the, the algorithm stuff myself, I was doing most of it in Ruby. Um, and I think, you know, using the language that you're most comfortable with and that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis, um, definitely, it, it definitely builds your uh, understanding of that language. You know, like you become more and more uh, comfortable with like using a function and be like, oh, I, I know what that probably does. You know, like, like I've never looked at the documentation for JavaScript's max, well, actually it doesn't have a max function uh, or max method, but it does have like, you know, reduce or uh, map, right? And I can say with some certainty that I know that map is on. Uh, where I guess it'd be O n times f, where f is the uh, the runtime of the function that you're passing in um, <clears throat> into your map. But um, you know, I, I can say that I, I don't I'm not looking at the source code. I can say I know that because there's no other sensible way to implement map other than doing it that way. Uh, any other questions? Uh, do you have a go-to resource to refresh your memory on the concepts we learned today? Well, I'm going to post the slides, so hopefully that will be a go-to resource. Um, but I mean, for this stuff, not really. Like, I mean, one thing that I was constantly frustrated with when I was learning this stuff is that I always felt like there wasn't really that good of like a centralized repository of good, high-quality learning. Um, like, there's stuff you know, like MIT Open Courseware and stuff, but it's it's much much higher scope and it's much more academic. Um, it's not really as focused on like what, if you distill this stuff to its essence, what's the most important stuff to learn? Um, and that's really the approach that I want, want, wanted to take to teaching algorithms is that, you know, it's not about absorbing every single CS concept and being able to, you know, name every single technical term. It's much more about understanding how it all fits together and understanding like what makes this stuff important. Um, and just kind of having a high level sense of what is going on uh, rather than knowing every single every single detail that for the most part is not that important. So uh, long answer, short answer is uh, not not really on memory. Uh, there are a lot of things that you can read. So you know, go through Wikipedia, go through Stack Overflow. Um, I don't know one that's like a good, like everything type, type of resource. <clears throat> I see there's still people in New York. I don't know if that means they want to ask questions or they're just hanging out. Hi. Hey, how's it going, Blue? Uh, oh, more people to the side. Oh, that's exciting. I thought it was just like the, the last five, like the Power Rangers, like hanging out afterwards. And... You're the troopers. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, the troopers. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Asif. Nice. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, you guys have any more questions or are we all? Is everyone, uh, everyone question down? I think after this, I'm probably going to take a nap. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Eric. I can only kind of hear you. Uh, what is the plan for the next session? There is no plan yet, actually. Uh, we just kind of, like I said, we threw this together uh, as just like a thing to do. Um, so I'm curious, uh, what do you, uh, let me, uh, it's probably a good question to ask you guys. Um, what do you guys think worked well here? What do you think we could, I mean, obviously the internet connection thing sucked. Um, so hopefully we can fix that next time. Um, but you know, are there things that I could do to improve? Like, is there a format you think would be better? Um, I was really worried about like this whole remote thing because like I'm used to teaching in person. So, uh, and also like doing doing like 70 slides of a PowerPoint the night before I do a presentation takes a long ass time. Yeah, <laughs> was not the best planning. Um, but yeah, I want to get you guys feedback. Like what uh, would make this better if we were to do this again? And what sort of topics potentially would you want to see, or how, like different kinds of content maybe you'd want to see if we were to do this again? Uh, any tips on negotiation? Let me let me get to that. Uh, ideally, 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Brian. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, the chair. Chair not super comfortable. Definitely not optimal here. Um, but this is this is the the meeting room that I was able to find my way to. Uh, I can kind of hear you. I'm talking because I'm not connected to text. My feedback is it was great. Don't change. Oh, anything. thank you. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Uh, cool. All right. So let's see here. Uh, can you talk about dynamic programming? Let me let me bracket that because people are asking about uh, data structures. So, uh, I'll answer that question very soon once we get some specific feedback about this session. So if people wanted me to do something on a data structure, what data structure would they like to see next? Um, I think we sent out we sent out a uh, questionnaire. I don't know people who are in the thing. Uh, so Patrick wants heaps and BST. Ned says heaps for sure. So sounds like there's a lot of certainty around heaps among two people. Heaps for days uh, or design pattern um, covering the heap and the stack. Okay, so that's a little bit different. Heap and stack are are, are more about programming languages and uh, then programs, <clears throat> or then algorithms per se. Uh, let's see, they have like polls, right? Let's do a poll. Can we do a poll? Uh, what's my question? Uh, what's the data structure you'd like us to do next? Actually, yeah, Joanne's probably right. We should probably do a survey. There are only 23 people here, so uh, we should probably just do, send out an email to everybody. Um, oh, I see. When are you guys leaving? Uh, cool, cool. Okay, so uh, super. Okay, super quick answers to the questions. Uh, Rh asks, can you ask about? Can you talk about dynamic programming? Uh, dynamic programming is basically just like it's a way to solve uh, problems using subproblems and memoizing those subproblems usually. Um, and so the easiest way to think about it is like recursion plus caching or recursion plus memoization is usually dynamic programming. Um, but, but any case where you use subproblems to solve bigger problems is dynamic programming. Uh, it's very hard. Um, it's usually like the hardest class of algorithms to try to implement. Um, so if you get into movie or Google, probably they'll ask you at least one or two dynamic programming questions. Um, I got uh, two dynamic programming questions when I was interviewing at Google. Um, so they're not like they're not necessarily worth knowing if you're not like trying to shoot for like the super super hardcore companies. Um, I would worry about other learning other CS concepts first because uh, you know dynamic programming is pretty up there in terms of challenge and difficulty. Um, <clears throat> okay, so was there one more question that I missed? Oh, uh, Ned asked any tips on negotiation. Uh, yeah, a lot of tips on negotiation. I'm actually going to be writing a blog post about this fairly soon. Um, so yes, actually, one thing I should mention: if you are, um, if if you are looking for you know job advice or learning more about uh, how to optimize your job search, uh, I wrote a big ass blog post uh, a couple weeks ago. That's now on my blog. If you just go there, I think it's the first entry. Um, that's about. Um, that's basically like a huge guide on how to train for algorithms and data structures and, and interviews. Um, so if you're curious, like the advice that I generally give, um, you, can, you can get most of it on, the, on my website. Uh, the, I'm going to do a blog post that follow up uh, specifically on negotiation. And it's gonna be pretty long, but I'm still writing it, so, but there's kind of too much stuff to really say in kind of one, one breath, and I'm already pretty exhausted. Uh, Keter asked, how do you send, how to send me a message if you have a question? Uh, so, you can just tweet at me. Uh, you can also uh, shoot me. Uh, you can shoot me an email from my website. Um, you are also in the New York JS meetup, so they can message you. Quickly. Yes, I'm also in the New York JS meetup, so you can message me. Um, Donnie says only feedback from improving the class is to talk about the chart of on on m squared. Uh, ah, I see. Yeah, yeah. Good call. Uh, I guess I, I guess I did uh, kind of jump straight into that before I went over the chart. Um, cool, yeah, I'll, I don't know if I'll end up doing this again, uh, although I feel like with the slides I made, it feels like kind of a shame to just do this once, because that was a lot of work and like a lot of 
coach right. I didn't realize how long it would take to do all this. This is quite a <laughs> quite an ordeal. I felt like I was in high school again because I was like, oh, I've got this thing tomorrow, and I'm it's like eight o'clock, and I barely started. And so I'm like, I stayed up to like two a.m. Uh, like writing all the slides and code snippets and stuff, but. It worked out, I think. People seem to like it, so that's great. Daniel, you're sure? <laughs> Daniel Lim is sure that we really appreciate it. Um, he's very sure. I don't know how he's so sure, but he's, he's sure. Uh, all right, awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. Thank you for uh, donating, if you did. I guess your $5 has gone to charity or however much you gave, and it's going to do awesome stuff. Thank Peace you. out from me from San Francisco. Uh, goodbye, everybody in New York and everyone tuning in. Bye. Thanks. Thank you for everything. Take care, everybody. <laughs>